Trooper Daniel Howard. Prosecutors claim he killed his wife and then tried to stage it to look like a suicide. Howard says he found his wife dead in the bathtub with a gunshot wound to the head. The defense began its case in chief yesterday. And this hour, we're watching testimony from two of their first three witnesses. Before we get to that, though, let's get you caught up on the case. For that, we turn to Court TV anchor Julie Grant. I knew right away there's, there's no way that she would have shot herself. February 2nd, 2021, 48-year-old Kendi Howard was found shot to death in the bathtub at the home she owned with her estranged husband, Dan. Her daughter spoke with local station KHQ and described how Dan told her about what happened. What did he say? That there had been an accident. Yes. And she was gone. He didn't even tell me that. He just said that she shot herself. Kendi and Dan Howard had been married for more than 25 years, but were in the process of divorcing. Her death initially appeared to be a suicide, but prosecutors believe she was killed before she was shot. Evidence will show that Kendi died of asphyxiation. That's the result of a carotid restraint, something Dan knew how to do. Dan's defense team says that evidence at the scene shows she died from the gunshot wound. Now, one of the scenarios is that she held it with her thumb on the trigger, which would lower that angle of the gun. She also, you'll hear as bruising on this hand from the impact of the gun. Prosecutors say the motive for Kendi's death was money. Dan was a retired Idaho state trooper. He and Kendi had about $2 million in assets that would have been split between them in the divorce. Dan Howard faces one count of murder and one count of domestic battery from an alleged assault in July of 2020. You don't want to think that someone you've known for your whole life has could actually do it. And I tried for about a week, just like, well, maybe this could have happened. Maybe this could have, like, and it, nothing would fit. Nothing fits into place to make it make sense. I anyway, expect the jury to be back in the courtroom about an hour from now out in Idaho. Meanwhile, we're catching uh, everybody up on the defense case so far, and they are going all in. The jury heard testimony from Daniel Howard's neighbor yesterday, and the defense focused in on an incident from 2020. Howard faces a murder charge for Kendi's death in February of 2021, but also this domestic battery charge from July of 2020. So let's pick up the testimony now as the defense asks Howard's neighbor about how he came up with that July date for when he claims he saw the victim fall down. When did you come upon that date? The date that I went in to see my doctors on, on Monday, the 13th of July? Yes. Uh, several weeks ago, um, I knew that I was going to have to I, I knew that I had hurt my arm. I wasn't sure of exactly what the dates were, so I called my doctors and re-verified that I had had when my surgery was, when my follow-up, when my bicep released, and then when they did the surgery to reattach my bicep. What happened of note uh, while you guys were there on that date? Um, I was helping Dan with my one arm. I think I handed him a couple of fishing poles or something. And Kendi and my girlfriend were up at the forward end of the boat. I was on the right side of the boat in the middle. And I heard, I heard her, I guess you could say heard her fall, but I heard her curse when she, when she fell and then I looked over, my girlfriend was standing there, and she stood up, and she'd fallen and hit the, uh, the trolling motor, apparently, that was right there in the front of the boat. Have you ever been asked by law enforcement about this event in the summer of 2020? No, the first time uh, anything was the, the, when we testified the last time, um, law enforcement never never contacted me ever uh, anything about this incident. Okay. 
in the three years? I guess. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, is it fair to say, um, well, let me, let me back up. How did you learn of Kennedy's passing? Oh, wow. Uh, I don't tell um, I would imagine uh, it would have had to been from Dan. I, I don't. I'm not I would, projecting. We were driving. He obviously doesn't know how they were. We were. Hang on for a second. Sorry. Well, based on the answer, it's speculative, so I'll sustain the objection. How would you describe um, Kendi and Dan's demeanors when they were together? when you spent time together? Well, they've been married for, I think, over 25 years, and they got along fine. I didn't see any, I didn't see anything out of the regular. They they had fun together. We all enjoyed going out on, and enjoying events. And I didn't, they had a good marriage as far as I'm concerned. Did you have opportunity to talk to Dan after Kennedy passed? Uh, yes, I did. How did you describe his demeanor? Uh, he, he was distraught. He was he was broken. He, I mean, Dan's not the type that usually wears his emotions on his sleeve. And I mean, I've seen him tear up a few times, and he was devastated. Okay, a neighbor on the stand talking about um, he witnessed a a fall from Kendi in in. in believed that that was the source of her injuries back in July of 2020. Um, he'll be cross-examined vigorously in a bit. Let's uh, bring in Franz Borkart. He's a criminal defense attorney. He's in Baton Rouge. The friendship of this witness, Dan and he are pretty tight. He knew Kendi. They all went out. Um, at, right at the end, though, he said Dan was devastated when their marriage collapsed. That's a trigger, right? I mean, that is um, someone who's devastated, and you know, there's only a few motives for murder, and and love is right up there with them, and, and money, and the state uh, alleges both here. How will the neighbor help and hurt the defendant? Well, so motive's always going to be an issue for the defense, right? Money, and she's moving on to somebody else. Um, but I'll, I'll say this, look, the, the jury gets to weigh the neighbor's bias and, and, and ask whether or not that affects credibility. I think he's been very credible. I think you're hearing a, a, a guy that's not going to get on the stand and just lie for his buddy. Um, and look, I think the whole he's devastated, the emotional effect, he, not the kind of guy that wears his emotions on his sleeve, got teared up. I think if I'm a juror, I'm like, well, that sounds to me like the kind of guy that may not let this woman that he loves leave him for another man, especially if it's going to cost him a bunch of money. So I, that's how I'm leading, Ted. Now, it works the other way, too. He loves her so much that he would never hurt her. Could, could a juror say that? Well, possibly. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it is interesting. I, I think it's going to be a, a science question at the end of the day. How did she die? And you're going to have these competing experts. Uh, we're expecting the medical examiner to take the stand for the defense. It was odd. You know, the medical examiner in this case determined that she died of this gunshot wound originally, and uh, the state had their expert come in and refute that. But this might come down to that. We'll see. It's an interesting case for sure. Let's get a break here. When we come back, we'll have the cross-examination of the neighbor, uh, Daniel Howard's neighbor. There he is. Uh, the prosecutor goes pretty hard at him. You'll see. Stay with us. The first parents in America to be charged in a mass school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter and four counts of it. The gun recovered from the shooter was the same gun that was purchased by his father. Jennifer was found guilty. Who is responsible for storing the gun? Now the school shooter's father is set to stand trial. My husband is. The school shooter dad trial. Live coverage today on Court TV. Thing. Welcome 
back. We're on verdict watch for the school shooter dad trial for James Crumbly. The jury has been deliberating now for three and a half hours and counting. It took the jury in Jennifer Crumbly, Crumbly's trial 10 hours and 45 minutes to reach a verdict there. We'll take you into court as soon as there is a question or a verdict. Nothing yet there in Michigan, but our team is standing by. Let's uh, return now to testimony, though, out in Idaho. The defendant in this case, Daniel Howard, is accused of murdering his wife, Kendi. Howard claims that she killed herself. She was found dead in a bathtub in February of 2021. Howard also faces a domestic battery charge for an alleged incident several months before her death back in July of 2020. We're going to pick up the testimony now with cross-examination of the couple's neighbor, Brett Gunderson. You and Dan have gotten a lot closer since Kendi's died, haven't you? Um, I, yes. You spend more time with him now? Um, as a neighbor, yes. He's your close friend now, isn't he? He is a friend, yes. He's your close friend now. Yes, he's a close friend, yes, sir. So back to this uh, July 2010 incident that you remember because you hurt your shoulder. And it sounds like you went back and refreshed your memory with some medical documentation. Is that what you're telling us? Well, I knew it was in, in June, July, or August, I believe. Um, I knew that my arm was, uh, I was having my issue with my arm and I'd had my surgery. And so it had to be during that, that time frame. So all I did was recheck with my doctors when the dates were, when I had my surgery. They didn't have the date when my bicep popped out, but they had the, the 13th when I went in to get it checked out. And then they had me, I went back into surgery um, because it's the VA, it took eight days for me to get back in. But eight days later, I had to reattach my bicep. And that gave you the date of July 10th, 2020? That, that gave me the, the time frame of when my, my arm was hurt and that I couldn't do a whole lot. I couldn't go camping. I couldn't do a lot of these things. And I know that's when this was that this happened. And I, and I looked it up and the dates and yes, that's. And this was at the request of Mr. Johnson? No. This was at the request of whom? This, it was on my own. It was. Well, why are you doing this? Because because I knew I needed to know my dates. I don't want to get up here and perjure myself by giving the wrong dates. Why did you win. need to know your dates? Because it was, again, when my arm was hurt during that summer was when I had, when all this stuff happened. There's a lot of other things that, that happened that summer. Um, but during this portion of it, that's, when this happened. And why is July 10th of 2020 important? Why did you need to remember it? It's my mother's birthday, and on the 13th was the day that I went in. I had pulled my bicep head detached from the bone and was running along the side of my arm. I get that, but why are you testifying about that in Dan Howard's trial? Because you asked me. No, no, no. This was brought up by Mr. Johnson. Why? Why are we talking about that? Because it happened around the time frame that Kendi fell and hit her chest on the, the trolling motor. Okay, so this is a attempt on your part to show how she got some injuries back in July of 2020. Is that I, accurate? I know your arm is good condition. You oh, didn't oh. ask the questions. It's a fair question. I'm not attempting to do anything. The prosecution ordered me to come here to testify. Um, I'm here to testify to the truth, what I saw and what happened, and that's it. You're, you understand you're testifying for your friend, Dan Howard. Do you understand that? No, I understand. I understand that I was asked to come here by the prosecution. I was told. I wasn't asked, I was told to be here today by the prosecution and to come here and I'm here to testify to the truth of what I've seen, what I've heard and what I've been asked. I'm not testifying for either side. How do you know she went down? Is that my peripheral? 
I saw movement. I saw movement, and then I heard, I heard whatever it was that I heard, ouch and, and the F word or whatever it was, and then we went on from there. I, How do you know she just didn't dip her head? Because of the follow-on curse words that I heard, that she didn't just dip her head. So you never saw her fall down, you just saw her head dip. Is that accurate? It is accurate to say that I did not physically see her body hit the, hit the front of the boat. Okay, did you see her fall down or not? Yes, out of my peripheral, I saw movement out of my, out of the right side, her dip down and then come back up, cursing and saying, just in front of the boat. And then, I, I mean, it was almost three years ago. I don't remember all the words and everything that was said. Okay, so she dipped down and what part of her body hit what? Could you see that? I couldn't see that part. Okay, so you don't know what she hit or what part of her body hit, whatever it is she hit. Is that accurate? That's accurate. That she was up in the front of the boat and then she dipped down, hit something, came back up and out something to that effect in her swerve. Well, when you start us out here, you said that your girlfriend and Candy were at the front of the boat. Are you talking about in the boat? No. Okay, they were on the ground. Um, or standing on somewhere on the trailer. There's a big difference there. Do you know which one it was? I believe they were standing on the trailer. I believe my girlfriend was standing. Or, uh, she could have been standing on the ground. Again, it was out of my peripheral. I'm halfway down the boat. So my view of what they could be standing on. Um, I, don't, I, I would have to. I would have to stand there on that boat and look again to see if I could see their feet. I, I don't remember anything about the feet or whose feet were where. Well, it sounds like you don't know where they were standing. Is that accurate? Specifically, no. I don't know where. You they don't know if they're on the ground or on the trailer, right? From my vantage view, yes. And you don't know what Candy hit, if she hit anything, or what part of her body hit, if it hit anything. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate, but there was the boat motor up there was the only thing that was logical. She either hit the boat motor or the front of the boat. I don't know. She hit something and then she came back up again. How did she hit right. the boat motor if she was on her feet in front of the boat? Well, she, she was elevated. If she was standing on the ground, I wouldn't be able to see her. So she had to be standing on something. She could have a step ladder. She could have been standing on the on the frame of the trailer. That I'm saying that I can't. I I didn't see that part, but I don't know. I don't know what I know the trailer, the camper was there, they had to load the camper, they were just stopping by to say hi and help them load the trailer. And that's Well this whole step ladder business. Did you see a step ladder? No, I didn't. Well, where, where did you come up with a step ladder? I, I'm just saying, I don't know what she was standing on, is what I'm saying. Well, then, if you don't know what she was standing on, how do you know what she hit? Because of where she was located on the boat. Because she was all the way up at the very front of the boat. If I had, well, I'm not going to guess where it was. My, I would assume that she was standing... You, you can't assume, sir. You have to tell us what you saw, okay? And just you have to tell us what you saw, okay? Yes, sir. All right. And it sounds like you didn't see anything, did you? I have my proof here. Just an argument her head come down. And her fault. Well, he answered the questions. Uh, oh, really, Judge? You don't know whether she injured herself or not, do you? Um, she... She always bruised really easy. She got some bruises. Did you hear the question, sir? Say, would you? You don't know whether she injured herself or not, do you? I know she ended up with a bruise from that because she talked about it with my girlfriend and they went on a trip and she was. Do you not understand the question, sir? You didn't see her injure herself, did you? I, I'm, 
I'm guessing that you can't guess. that is that I can't say that I definitely saw her injure herself. Well, you just got done telling us you didn't see anything. Do you remember that? No, I didn't say I didn't see anything. You saw her head dip. I saw that she was elevated. I could see the top of her. She was my girlfriend. She was meeting her. I was on the side of the boat. She went down. There was an ouch or something to that effect, some cursing, and then she, like, ow, that hurt. Uh, that was basically the end of the uh, cross-examination of the neighbor there. Let's talk to Franz Borchardt again. He's in Baton Rouge. Um, cross, the prosecutor was, was clear that uh, he didn't believe him and uh, trying to get that across to the jury. You're here for your buddy, and you've been hanging out ever since um, she died. Uh, your thoughts? So I didn't think it was a great cross, actually, Ted. Um, I think as a prosecutor... Or? Too aggressive. I think you could, you can go with a soft cross on this guy and, and be just effect, as effective. And what's worse is the witness testified clearly that he is actually there because of the prosecution, not because of the defense, not because of his buddy. He was told that he had to be there by the prosecution. That to me is a harpoon, a harpoon in the whale of the prosecution's case. <laughs> a harpoon. Let's uh, fast forward here to the what we expect to take place at about half an hour from now when the court is back live. The defense bringing on the medical examiner that did the autopsy and, and had the initial cause of death as suicide. This is big because, you know, it's jurors tend to give the guy that actually saw the dead person a little credit. And um, yes, he was on his way out retiring. Now he's retired, so we'll have to see. But um, this if I'm the state, I've got a rebuttal witness teed up, another um, expert to come in, because this could be some major damage, depending on how this guy comes across. So this is a perfect storm for the defense, right? So the first witness, the local guy, the guy that the police use must be incompetent. That's what the state's saying. He, he is incompetent. We can't trust him. So we had to hire this other expert to testify as to what we wanted, right? That is the defense's posture right now. And if, if the state's witness, the first person to see this body is incompetent, then what else about the state's case is unreliable and can't be trusted. How bad do they want to convict this guy? So bad that they're willing to hire a, a hired gun? That's going to be the defense's posture, right? And yeah, you're, Ted, you said it earlier. How often does the defense call the state's witness to the stand to testify? You know, he has to get up there and say he was wrong. I don't know that he's going to say that. I doubt he will if they're going to take, I'm sure they've talked to him and uh, they're not going to let him do that. Uh, they wouldn't bring him on. I think he's going to get up there and say, I, this is what I saw at the time. It's going to be a battle of the experts. And um, that for a former sheriff deputy uh, is probably a good thing uh, that uh, they can sort of switch. If you could switch the juror's mind into the technical world of which expert was right, it takes away from that love and money sort of, I bet he did it. The only way you get away from her not having a motive to kill herself, right? That's the big question is why in the world would she kill herself? Is if the forensic science can be shown to be unreliable with regard to her possibly having a head trauma and being dead when the shot was fired, right? Which is what the state's essentially arguing is, is that the, the head trauma, the injuries on her body came before the shot. And so the shot by inference was used to cover up something or to do something else. If you can become, if you can muddy the waters, so to speak, and show that that's not reliable and that's not truthful and credible, then all of a sudden you can't exclude the fact that she may have killed herself, even if the killing of herself has no rational basis. Like why in the world would she kill herself? And that's where reasonable doubt may exist. Maybe not. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an opening for this defendant. Let's get a break. Uh, we just heard from the neighbor. Now we get to hear from the neighbor's girlfriend. She's next.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. We're watching that uh, deliberations clock tick away in the corner of your screen. The jury in Michigan is deliberating the fate of school shooter dad James Crumbly, and they have been at it now almost four hours. Crumbly is facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter after prosecutors say he failed to stop his son Ethan from killing four students at Oxford High School back in 2021. His wife Jennifer was convicted earlier this year of the same charges. As soon as we have any movement in the courtroom, we will take you there live. Meanwhile, back to Idaho, where we've been watching this testimony in the defense's case in the jealous ex-trooper murder trial. The defendant in this one, Daniel Howard, up next on the stand, Carrie Maitland. This is a testimony from yesterday. We're waiting for the jury to report back in about a half an hour from now in Idaho. Uh, this was yesterday. She's Brett Gunderson's girlfriend, the guy that was just, uh, we were just watching testimony from. They lived near the Howards for 20 years, knew him very well. She testified about her relationship with Kendi and about the moment that Kendi told her about her affair. So back in the summer of uh, 2020, did you ever um, see uh, Dan and Kendi in their shop area? Yes, yes. And can you explain? Um, they would be out in, you know, out in the yard or out doing things, you know, summertime. Um, Kendi sometimes would um, be offloading something out of her car or groceries or whatever. And so if we, if we were driving by, we'd stop if I was with Brett or we'd stop individually, so. Now, um, is this a, this uh, road you live on, is this a um, dead end road or a major? It's a road? private road with a cul de sac at the end, yes. And how many residents live in that? There's area? nine homes. Okay. In the summer of 2020, was there anything that you observed between that involved the boat? Yes. Can you explain? Um, Brett and I were headed out. We saw um, the camper and the, and the boat out and them out as well. And so we swung in um, really quick, just to, just like neighbors do. And um, we came, we pulled in, we got out. Um, Candy was, she had a, a basket or a crate or whatever. I don't, I can't even describe it. And put it up into the camper and slam the camper door shut. She was kind of in a, can I say pissy mood? Um, she she wasn't exactly happy. So I was like, hey, you know, what you doing? And just, you know, trying to distract her a little bit that way. And um, she had something down here on the ground and she had something up here on the boat, um, on the front of the boat. Brett went back, of course, and talked to Dan because that's just, that's what we did. We divided, you know, male, male, female, female. And um, when we went <clears throat> our separate ways, I was kind of standing towards the front of the boat with Kendi right there. And she was, like I said, she was grumpy. And she was at the front of the boat and she was reaching out with this, it wasn't a large, thing but it was she was reaching out with it and she slipped and she fell and she fell down like boom like that there was a lot of foul language that was involved like oh, that hurt you know those kind of things and um, I was like oh my god Kenny are you okay you know and then she's like yeah I'm fine and that was kind of the end of it um were you ever asked by law enforcement about uh, that event? No. Was there ever a time that uh, Kendi uh, discussed uh, her affair with you? Yes. Uh, when was that? It was end of September, first part of October. And if you can go ahead and pull it up like a little bit closer. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it, can you say that again? When was it? In the end of September, first part of October. Okay. Um, did she tell you who, who it was? With? She did not say a name. She just said that it was someone from that she's known for a while. And where did this conversation take place? On my back deck. What were you guys 
doing? We were just drinking and talking, and um, she was excited about getting a costume for a Halloween party, and it led to her telling me about it. Can you describe in general um, the um, her demeanor throughout the course of that conversation? Started out jovial. We were just hanging out. We were being good friends. And then um, as the conversation proceeded, she became uncontrollable. Um, she got angry. And she, she was mad, but she was sad. And it just, and she was spiraling. Did her demeanor cause you? Did you ever discuss your observations with anyone? No. Do you regret that? Did you ask you relevance as to what she might regret or not regret? So sad. And Carrie, how did you learn of Kendi's passing? appointment at the DMV and we were leaving and there was police cars. And the to the narrative form of the answer. Oh, you can continue. And the coroner's truck was there and so I texted, I messaged her on messenger. Are you okay? I'm worried about you and I didn't get any response. Okay, the uh, neighbor who knew the victim very well in this case. Let's get a break. We'll um, watch the cross-examination, see how the prosecutor is pretty rough on her husband, the other, the neighbor. Uh, how's he going to handle this woman? We'll find out right after this. Join Court TV's Vinny Politan. In every story, in every trial, every case, there's at least two sides to it. To dive into the latest. Oh my God. And breaking true crime stories. This was a very targeted, very personal attack. Inside. My whole life depends on it. And outside of the courtroom. She's a psychopath. Now, let's look at the other side of all of that. Vinny Politan investigates. Saturday morning, 10, 9 central. Only on Court TV. are continuing to keep our eyes on the deliberations clock in Michigan where a jury has been deliberating now for over four hours in the school shooter dad trial. Prosecutors allege that James Crumley did not take the necessary steps to prevent his son Ethan from killing four students at Oxford High School back in 2021. We'll continue to monitor the courtroom there. Once we see any movement, we will go there live if there's a question and of course if there's a verdict. In Idaho, we are expecting testimony to resume at the top of the hour. We've been watching testimony from the defense case in the jealous ex-trooper murder trial for defendant Daniel Howard. The state had a chance to cross-examine Carrie Maitland about her relationship with Kendi and about their conversation in the final days before Kendi's death. What did she fall on? She fell right here in this area. That's it's right there. You, uh, okay, hang on. So, and the pedal. So you're pointing to the trolley motor at the bow of the boat, right? Yes, she fell on the bow of the boat. And she was lifting this container of whatever it was to the left of that motor, right? She was right here, and she was lifting up, and she fell. Okay. And she caught herself on her arm, like you do when you're scared of falling. You grab out, and she caught herself. So did she... Set the container to the left of the motor. Um, it actually tipped over, so I couldn't tell you if it was on the left, right, or whatever. Do you see how the trolling motor sticks up above the bow? I see how it sits in. Do you see how if she stood on the trailer, it would be natural for her to put it to the left of the trolling motor? 
I assume. Because the trolling order is so high, and to put it over the trolling order would be very difficult. She wasn't over the trolling order, sir. She fell on the trolling order. She was reaching in, and she fell. Where did she set what she had before she fell? Set it? It fell. Fell where? It fell on this flat surface right here, because that's flat. She, it fell and tipped over. It was just a whole, it was quick. Okay. I don't know what you want me to tell you, sir, but it tipped over. I don't know what was in it. I just, I asked her. I just want you to answer the questions, okay? Okay. So when she put this container down and fell, or she fell and the container fell, it was to the left of the trolling board, right? I assume so, sir. Well, you saw it happen, didn't you? Yeah, I assume the basket ended up you know, to the left of it. It was in the middle of the thing, so well, I can't say left or right. Okay, well, the problem is we have to know what you saw, and we can't rely on what you assume. So did you okay. see her put well, it to the left of the trolling motor? Yeah, not? it would be to the left, because if she went to the right, it would have not been in the book. Uh, and so if she's reaching to the left of the trolling motor when she falls, wouldn't she hit the bow of the boat as opposed to the trolling motor? She hit both things, sir. She was stepping forward onto this. This is why her foot slipped. She was stepping forward. She had, I'm not doing it in my dress. She had her foot here, and she was reaching to put that up because she was going to get down. I'm assuming because I didn't ask her, but there's another bucket right here of other things that needed to go up in the boat so that when she was up in the boat, she could just offload everything that she needed. Do you remember what the question was? No, sir. Wouldn't it be more realistic and logical for her to hit the bow of the boat as opposed to the trolling motor if what she's setting down is to the left of the trolling motor? In your opinion, sir. I know well, I'm asking. Is. I'm asking your opinion now. Wouldn't that be more logical and realistic? No, not in the situation that I witnessed. And so after she, well, did she hit both the trolling motor and the bow of the boat, or just the trolling motor? She hit, she hit like this. She came down and she caught herself. I, she probably here, she probably has a bruise on the elbow too, um, the way she came down. Because she was stepping forward here, this foot slipped out and she just came down. Okay, and she just came down here right here at the bow of the boat. So the point of the boat's here, with the trolling motor over here. She fell right in this area. Her foot slipped. It actually slipped out this direction, and she came down. I get that. I'm just trying to figure out what she fell on the trolling motor or the bow of the boat. Counsel, I'm going to interject. Just, do you have a sense of, I, I was letting you go know, because I thought you were near the end, but we're after 5 o'clock. Should we continue with cross-examination tomorrow? I don't think I have much more to go judge. You want to wait another five minutes? Is that doable? Okay. All right, let's finish it up. Trolling motor, bow of the boat, where did she fall? She fell and hit the bow of the boat and the trolling motor, sir. I'm, I don't know what else I can tell you. Now, you've talked to us that you were closer to Candy than Dan. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. But didn't you end up getting very close to Dan after the Candy's? We, we have become death? acquaintances. I'm, um, I'm Brett's girlfriend. So when Brett goes over, you know, and so I, yes, sir, I've gotten to know Dan. And haven't you assisted Dan in rounding all of Candy's stuff up and getting rid of it? Objection outside of scope of cross. It goes to bias. Mm -hmm. Was, was the <laughs> I didn't round up her stuff. Um, Chris had brought them things downstairs, and I helped organize the pants and things that went to a consignment. So you helped sell Katie's possessions? I didn't sell them, sir, but yes, I did help organize them. Did you help get rid of your chickens as well? No, sir. You didn't have any part in that? No, sir. Did you have any part in making sure um, Brooke didn't get any of Candy's possessions? I had nothing to do with what the family did. You mean Dan? Is that what you mean? Yes, sir. Dan had a partner. Is that yes, correct? Sir. 
You have to say what you, what you mean out loud because a court reporter is taking down your speech. I had no relevance to what Brooke was given or not given. I so. get that. And the next question was, that was up to Dan Howard, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Okay, the cross-examination there. Let's bring back Franz Borkart. Franz, your thoughts on now the neighbor's girlfriend. Again, she's never going to admit that she's lying or she's biased. So some of the jousting of the prosecutor is is just, I, I, I don't want to say it's a waste, it's performance, right? Um, I don't think this case is going to come down to these neighbors, um, although she was pretty adamant about the nature of the fall, right? So even in the face of a hard cross, she was like, I don't know what you want me to say. This is how she fell, right? This is how she landed. This is going to come down to do they believe expert number one or do they believe expert number two? And if they believe expert number one, then there's reasonable doubt that he didn't kill her because it was a suicide. And it's just that simple, Ted. Getting into whether or not the neighbor helped dispose of the of the uh, possessions of the deceased individual, it, 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 it's a little petty. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't really, I don't think that moves the football one way or another. I mean, and then in closing, what's the defense going to say? What were they supposed to do? Erect a shrine to her and never get rid of her stuff and be, be constantly reminded about the fact that she committed suicide? I mean, that's just not, I don't, I don't understand why he's going there other than it's just a little petty.